You're listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie, the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Welcome to the NASM CPT Podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie, and today we're going to be talking about core training. So get ready, y'all. I'm going to spend about 20 minutes with you today just discussing some things about core training. But first, I'm going to give you a little intro story. Uh, Several years back, I went out to a place called East Brunswick, New Jersey, and I was going to teach an exercise science course out there, and I'm not entirely sure what is in the water out in East Brunswick, New Jersey, but I was by far one of the smallest humans out there, so I I don't know if there was a, a, a chemical leak in the water or what it was, but these guys at that gym, and a lot of the women too, were jacked, bro. They were basically all bodybuilders. Everybody walked in with a gallon of water and uh, their own meals, and they're getting ready for this exercise science workshop that I'm going to be teaching. Now, I'm 5'8", and I'm uh, about, and at the time, well, I was 160 pounds, and that's bigger then than I am now. So there, it's just it's going to be a hard time for me to garner the respect that I would want teaching this workshop, uh, being my stature teaching to those guys. So what was interesting is at some point this gigantic man comes in, and his name is Willie. And I've never seen a person this big in my entire life, not not in real life. And he walks in, and I'm telling you, everybody basically dropped their smoothies and ran over to him like the bodybuilding messiah had just show up, shown up. And they're asking him questions and talking to him and trying to, to tap him on the shoulder about this and that. And he's really nice, and he kind of talks to everybody, and then he walks up to me, and he goes, hey, how you doing? My name is Willie. I say, hey, nice to meet you. Do me a favor. I'm gonna, I may need your help here, because clearly people are coming to you, and they respect you, and basically nobody's even said hi to me since I've been here, and I'm teaching the course, so I'd appreciate your help. And he was like, oh, absolutely. He was super nice and very supportive. And so we did a couple of different exercises when we were talking about the core, and uh Part of it was, you know, I had him put his arm out and try to stabilize his arm without stabilizing his core. So he'd put his arm out in front of him, like chest height, shoulder height, and I'd push down on his arm and I'd tell him not to activate his core. Uh, Which is, by the way, that's an impossibility. You can't maintain arm position out in front of you with somebody pushing down on it unless you activate your core. So then after we gave a few examples with that, then I said, all right, uh, Willie, go ahead and activate your core, tighten up your core. And he did, and I pushed his arm down just as easily as I did before. And I was like, this is really weird. Yo, bro, you get to win now. You get to win. Put your arm out. Hold it. Don't let this little guy push your arm down. And I started to push it down again. And I did something that I kind of regret, but I pretended that he was stronger to make a point about, you know, when you tighten your core. But he wasn't any stronger, and it was baffling me. I was really bothered by it. So uh, at that point, I say, okay, hey, guys, let's go. And everybody partner up with your somebody your own size. And since nobody was Willie's size, he partnered with a uh, short woman named Fatima, I remember, was in the course. And so they partnered up together. And all I know is I'm walking around the course, and I hear a thump. And I turn around, and Willie is raising his hand, and he asks this question. Why can she hold her plank for three minutes, and I can't hold mine for three seconds. And everything clicked right into place. I knew exactly what was going on. I had a complete understanding of the situation. And then I kind of felt bad for kind of fudging everything at the beginning, but I didn't understand or comprehend it at the time. And this was really helpful. So I said, I've got two questions for you. Do you wear a weight belt? That was number one. And number two, do you always lift for max strength reps? Now, those are two questions I want to come back to at the end of this as we get into the topic of the core and talking about the core and what it's for. So here's some research about the core I just find very interesting, and you may want to uh, to take this and put it in your back pocket. We have research that about 80 to 85% of the population in this country are, uh, have experienced debilitating lower back pain. 
80% of the people with chronic lower back pain have decreased muscle activation in core muscles or in muscle groups in the core. Lower back peeps tend to have weak back extensors. But before you just go out and say, hey, I, I think that you probably have weak back extensors, let's go do back extensions, we also need to be familiar with this, that research shows that going directly into performing back extension exercises without proper core stabilization increases disc pressure to dangerous levels, as well as ligament pressure, and it also creates narrowing of the foramina or the holes in between the vertebrae that the, uh, that the nerves go through. So you want to be aware of that and make sure that you're doing a pretty thorough assessment and also adding in your core stabilization exercises. We know that people with lower back pain tend to have decreased muscular endurance and the trunk muscle weakness is an independent risk factor for developing lower back pain. Now that's just for people with lower back pain. Usually people don't necessarily care that they have weak core muscles unless it has uh, an adverse effect on how they feel or how they function. So lower back pain is a clear indication. That's how somebody feels. Now, the example with with Willie that I gave in the beginning, uh, it was an example of function. However, uh, this guy wearing a weight belt, it's, it's basically like Samson having his hair every time he puts it on. And every time he takes it off, it's like being cut. Like he goes from having core strength and stabilization artificially provided for him. And then as soon as that belts off, his functional strength was incredibly low. So that's something to be aware of. Now, when we talk about the core, we need to identify what that is. And I know some people hate the term core. Like, that's just a thing for people. I don't like using the word core. All right, cool. Don't don't use it. That's fine. It's just a word. It's just a word. So when we talk about the core of an apple, then... You know, nobody's like, I don't like that word core. I mean, it's just, it simply means the center of something, right? So this is the center of of our movement. It's where our movement originates from. And it's where our appendages attach to. So basically, if you think this, unplug your arms and your legs and you're left with your core. So if you want to use the word trunk, go for it. I've heard people use the term column yeah, if that makes sense for you, bro, go for it. If, if you don't have an affinity for the word core, find another word, but honestly stop being angry at other people if they use the word core because you kind of know what it means. So we've got this core. Now, NASM likes to define it as the lumbopelvic hip complex, thoracic and cervical spine. So any muscle that attaches or crosses over it, which means any muscle that crosses over the lumbo, which is lumbar, pelvic, pelvis, hip is Oh, that's hip. So anything that crosses over them. So you would literally be looking at muscles like the glutes and the hamstrings and the rectus fem as part of your core complex as far as that definition is concerned. And we can identify these muscles as core muscles, but there are different types of muscles. There are core stabilization muscles and there are core mobilization muscles. So ones that are global movers and ones that are primarily stabilizers. Now, in many instances, the stabilizers have movement capacities and the movement muscles have stabilization capacities, though that's not what they're designed for. That's not really their ideal function. It's just a supportive process that goes along with it. So, and, and what are we trying to stabilize primarily? Well, yes, the, the pelvis and the hips, absolutely. But we also look at stabilization in the vertebrae. So between one vertebra and another, we want to stabilize each vertebra on top of each other. So that is called intravertebral stabilization, right? Intravertebral stabilization. So I know that it's going to go from one stabilization to another, to another, to another, stabilizing each one of of those vertebrae. And then there's intravertebral stabilization. And intravertebral stabilization is a little bit different. So with that, we're looking more at what's going on globally with stabilization. So that's more, so the concept of things like um, attaching your uh, rib cage and your pelvis together, 
right? So that's what we'd be looking at. But in between each vertebrae, those are going to be smaller muscles. They're going to be stabilizing muscles. Those are going to be muscles like the multifidus muscles, where you've got deep erector muscles, the transversus spinalis muscles, uh, the rotatories. All of these, these are tiny, tiny muscles in between each vertebrae. Uh, stabilization muscles also include very commonly we'll hear people talk about transverse abdominus a lot and transverse abdominus creates that drawing in maneuver it's your body's internal weight belt and then the diaphragm which is a breathing muscle uh, pelvic floor muscles are the muscles in the pelvis that close off the exits Mm -hmm. the internal obliques primarily um the internal obliques will support that, and then the posterior fibers of the external obliques. So you have all of these muscles that create a support system in stabilizing the core. And when you look at stabilizing the core, you want the vertebrae to stack on top of each other and stabilize. Now, if I jump directly into doing core movement exercises like crunches or rotations, but I don't have the vertebrae that are on top of each other stabilized intervertebrally right there together, then you might get a bit more shearing taking place. You might get some anterior to posterior movement or vice versa, PAs and not APs. So there are movements that could take place within these vertebrae if they're not stabilized. And that's why stabilization is remarkably important and primarily important prior to going into these more global movement exercises with your core. Now, I asked these questions to Willie Uh, do you always wear a weight belt? Now, we talked about the transverse abdominus being the internal weight belt. So I asked him when he lifted weights, did he always wear a weight belt? And Willie told me, yeah, yeah, I always wear uh, wear a weight belt when I work out. Now, the reason I asked him if he always lifted heavy is because I can understand if you're always lifting for max strength that you may want to protect your back. So I'll concede to that, and I understand that if that's part of your sport and you're protecting your back, I get it. But he didn't always lift for max strength. He lived for hypertrophy. He's a bodybuilder. He was one amateur win away from getting his pro card, and that was the following weekend he was going to be having that um, that that amateur win, which took place. So when I asked the question about the weight belt, and he puts the weight belt on, I'm going to ask this question. If you've ever had a cast on your body, and I, I've had it on my leg. I've had knee surgery twice, so never a cast, but they would splint it at my leg, and it was splinted, and what happens six weeks later or whatever it is when you take the cast off of your body? What, what do you notice? Yeah, the opposite of hypertrophy, which is hypertrophy is the growth of skeletal muscles. We have atrophy, so atrophy has taken place. We've lost size in specifically speaking, our skeletal muscle. Well, Willie had been wearing a cast, so to speak, around his abdominal region his entire lifting life. So again, we're going to take this concept of atrophy with a cast, apply it to his core, and really be able to almost very clearly identify that once the weight belt is off, He's taken his cast off. He has no strength. So he's literally got no strength in these stabilization muscles, transverse abdominus, the diaphragm, multifidus, erector spinae, deeper erector spinae muscles, pelvic floor, internal obliques, posterior fibers of external obliques. He's not producing stabilization with these muscles. So I said something unintentionally that was incredibly offensive to Willie. I said, "Uh, well, when he said, why I fall down after three seconds, she can hold it for three minutes. And it just pops in my head. I was like, oh, bro, you got a weak core. And he, it was like, don't make me angry. And he gets up and he pulls his shirt up and I see his checkerboard abs sticking out, almost punched me in the eye. I almost got hit by an ab. And I was like, what? That's incredible, bro. That looks so dope. But that's a different muscle group, man. You're working these movement muscles. You have a large, well hypertrophied rectus abdominis muscles. But I didn't say you had weak abs. I say we have weak core muscles. And going through and having this conversation, it was it helped to clarify a lot with this group of fitness professionals to say, look, here's this guy that everybody when he walked in the door was like, whoa, 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 what? So big, so strong, so powerful. And now they look at him, they say, man, I get it, but 
there there are holes in your game, bro. And honestly, what should have been happening, that, that dude left his weight belt on. I could have pulled down on his arm. I could have climbed on his arm, bounced on it a few times, and then jumped off of it like a diving board. That's how big this dude is, and that's what I'm expecting. And the strength that this guy has was not what I got. I got him being just as weak when his arm is out without the, the weight belt when I told him it's tight in his core. So we want to pay attention to these types of situations. And we want to be able to also do very clear assessments with people. So now let's go through and just talk about some of these muscles. The transverse abdominis uh, runs transversely. So it's a, the muscle fibers run horizontally off over the center of the abdomen. And they help do what's called the drawing in maneuver. So we're going to talk about the difference between drawing in and bracing in just a moment. But the transverse abdominis does something called the drawing in maneuver or allows you to suck in your belly button. Now, the common thing that I see take place when I ask people to draw in their belly button is they suck in their belly button, but they also crunch. They also go into a little bit of spinal flexion, and that gives me a clear indication that they don't fully understand that drawing in the belly button and flexing the spine are two different things. So we want to make sure when they draw in the belly button that, that there is zero movement in the spine. I don't want to see spinal flexion. That means you're not differentiating rectus abdominis from transverse abdominis. So belly button goes in without spinal flexion so you can create this differentiation between these two muscles. Now the diaphragm muscle, we always hear the diaphragm is a muscle that helps you breathe. And if you've ever done a class of whether it's a speech class or a theater class or a singing course or something like that, and they say, diaphragmatic breathing, we want to hear you in the back row. And it's interesting we say that because the diaphragmatic breathing, actually when the diaphragm concentrically contracts, it helps to create the inhalation. So if I'm trying to project, that is an exhalation. And it, even though the diaphragm eccentrically is doing that, we have a lot less control over that eccentric uh, contraction, a lot more control over the concentric contraction as we breathe in our air. So breathing in is what the diaphragm does. It pulls down and allows the thoracic cavity to open up and allows the, um, the lungs to fill with more air. Now the multifidus muscles they, they go from the transverse process to the spinal process, and oftentimes they skip a vertebrae in between. So they create like these arrow shapes from the spinous process at the top and then maybe skip a vertebrae and go to the transverse processes out to the side. So it does help to create a little bit of rotation, but its primary job is to help stabilize the, the core, uh, stabilize those vertebrae. The deep erectors of the spine, we're looking at these paraspinal muscles, these other tiny muscles around the spine, whether they are the erector spinae, um, there's possibility, yes, that the erector spinae can stabilize, but their primary goal is to erect the spinae, so to lift the spine. But smaller muscles are going to work there. Pelvic floor muscles, actually when you squeeze the pelvic floor, that's kind of like when you have to go to the bathroom or pass gas and you're trying not to. So you're squeezing everything, trying not to let anything escape. So you're closing off the, elf, uh, the, elfus, the pelvis. So that muscle actually pulls up. So if you've got the diaphragm pulling down, the pelvic floor pulling up, and the transverse abdominus surrounding that entire abdominal area with those two other things going on, then what you've done is you've created what's called... Uh, intra-abdominal pressure, or pressure is increased within, within the abdominal wall. And if I'm going to create that intra-abdominal pressure, then it's going to help to stabilize my core. And the drawing in maneuver helps to create a feed-forward mechanism for the pelvic floor to activate and for the diaphragm to activate. Now, uh, the internal fibers of the external obliques attach directly to the uh, thoracolumbar fascia or the thoracolumbar aponeurosis, which is in the lower back. So that helps to stabilize the muscles in the, or, or the vertebrae in the lumbar spine. And then the external fibers of, sorry, the uh, posterior fibers of the external obliques tend to do the same thing. So we look at this concept now of drawing in where I'm sucking in the belly button versus bracing. 
And bracing is basically if if I say, all right, hey, tighten your abs. I'm going to give you a little punch in the stomach. So you tighten your abs tight. And it might include a bit of drawing in, but it's that tightness in the abs that's going to protect your back. And we can agree that that's also going to help to support your spine when you're doing things like lifting. Oftentimes, people will do something called a Valsalva maneuver. And a Valsalva maneuver is interesting because it is the closing of sphincters uh, both on the backside and on the top side. So there's actually the sphincter that goes um, in through your esophagus down into your stomach. So you close that sphincter off. Uh, and then there is the closing of the, the throat. So you're not, you're not breathing (laughs) and then squeezing the backside. And the reason it's okay. The Valsalva maneuver is a real thing and it's okay, but you have to be very careful using the Valsalva maneuver because what can happen is that there can be a huge spike in your blood pressure, and it can also lead people to, once they hold that for too long, especially while lifting, can cause people to pass and faint, uh, pass out and faint. And I've seen some videos on the old YouTube that prove to me that that's not something you want to really participate in. So be aware of the Valsalva maneuver and use it sparingly, but also you may want to focus on, well, how can I tighten my core and continue to actually breathe at the same time? So here is a, this is a little bit about the core and the lumbopelvic hip complex and how your body works and what the core does when, when other muscles are going. And, and what happens truly is if, if you can't support your arms or your legs through your core, then your arms and your legs also won't be able to activate uh, unless you're doing some fixed path of motion machines. And that's where we see a big discrepancy where you might see good, like what we would look at as being very strong on maybe a knee extension machine. But when you put it into a functional pattern, you're unable to produce really any additional forces, even though when you do a single joint exercise, then you seem to be quite strong. When you move that over into an, um, uh, a free weight exercise or a functional pattern, then that, that strength that you have no longer exists because it can't be supported through the core. So this is an example of core training, the benefit of core training, and kind of get an idea of what muscles are involved. Uh, the difference between inter- and intervertebral stabilization and drawing in and bracing. All right, cool. Well, I hope that helps out. If you got questions, give us a shout out. You can hit me up at rick, R-I-C-K dot Richie at nasm.org. Let me know what questions you have, what topics you want to hear, and I look forward to talking to you soon. This is the NASM CPT Podcast.